When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You study it, you memorize You guys, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in our churches are actually making disciples? They memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. He said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said? And talk about how much we know. It's just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I would start making disciples. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, I'm excited to, to jump into what's week two of our three-week series on um, discipling people. Uh, this is uh, week two. We're going to see if uh, the PDF will pull up on there. If not, we'll fly solo. You've got um, a note sheet in your bulletin. Um, and yeah, last week we, we started with discipling people uncluttered. And we did look at the, the Greek word that Jesus used. You know, we're going to spend two weeks talking about this. He was kind of making fun of people who just talk about discipling other people, but then, or churches that talk about it, but don't actually do it. You know, we're going to talk about this for two weeks. And then next week, our final week, is I'm going to challenge us, everybody in this room, to be a part of discipling somebody else or getting discipled if you're not ready to disciple somebody else. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll give another minute or two and then, um, and uh, if they can't load that, we'll just fly without it. Okay. All right. Well, we're just going to use your note sheet then. So we're, that, that's basically the main picture in some of the slides. Um, technology is great when it works and when it's not, that's okay. We don't need it anyways. Um, okay. So last week, the main part of the lesson was just basically learning how discipling people is simple. In fact, it's so simple, even a caveman could do it. You know, it's just two components. And when Jesus tells his disciples to go and disciple other people, he added a couple details. So he added a third. But um, we saw how last week, you know, the main verb used was mate tevo. Okay, not a complicated verb. Um, he just said, go and mate tevo, all the people groups, Matthew 28. In fact, there was this last words. And we talked about how last words are kind of important. Not only are last words important, but he prefaced it by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, you know what I mean? If somebody says that, whatever the next thing they say is, it's probably pretty important. We probably should, should do it, you know. <laughs> if all authority has been given to me. I want you to go clean your room. You know, then cleaning your room is probably pretty important, you know, but that's not what he said, obviously. He said, go and disciple people. Go and disciple all the people groups. So um, so the verb was mate tevo, and we just looked at how it was something that one person or persons would do for another person. Okay, it was a transitive verb. So one person or two people would mate tevo another person or, or people or small group. So, uh, and then we looked at how it had two components. And you can write these on your, the first page, that, that squiggle, that little discipleship squiggle that we're using. In the first two boxes, the first component is teaching that person something. Okay, so it involves teaching someone. If you're going to disciple people to be a public speaker, you're going to teach them how to be a public speaker. If you're going to disciple them how to do some other skilled trade like it was used in, in antiquity, you know, whatever the content is, that's what you teach them. So you have to teach them something or else it's not discipling somebody, you know. Um, so teaching them something. And then the second component is sharing your life with that person for that season of time that you're teaching them. Sharing your life with the person. That's in the second box. Okay, it could be for six months. You know, it could be for 
nine months. It could be sometimes Paul would spend up to two years in a city discipling the people that he'd won through the gospel. But yeah, so, so it's one person teaching another person or persons. And then for, you know, for maybe a six month period. But during that period, you actually interweave your life with theirs. So that's, those are the two components that discipling Mate Tevo had. That's it. That's it. So you don't really need to read lots of books on discipleship. I mean, that's what discipleship, the word that Jesus used, that's what it meant, doing that for some person. And then we saw how, you know, immediately after Jesus gave that commission, he said, he added two details about the way he wants Christians to disciple people. He says, I want you to disciple all the people groups. And then remember the two little supporting verbs that he adds right after that? baptizing them remember that go and disciple all the people groups baptizing them and then anybody remember what the next action is that he said and teaching them and which they already knew teaching because he had used the verb disciple but he gives them some clarity on what specifically he wants us to teach people when we disciple them and what does he say we, he specifically wants us to teach them teach them to obey Ooh, wow, that was like, there was like a lot of different things there. Yeah, maybe we should read it. Uh, oh, and the hymnal is not going to help me read it. So if you've got your Bible, why don't you open up to, to Matthew 28, uh, 18 to 20. It is basically our only main text. We have one other text that we'll be using. And look at that. We've got a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so actually, you don't even have to open up your Bible unless you want to read it from there. But, you know, feel free to use your Bible or if, or if you're my age on your phone. Okay. Um, if you want to. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, that, yeah, that's, that would be it right there. Perfect. So, yeah, go and um, disciple all the people groups, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Okay? I think this is great. I know sometimes you read that, we're like, oh, commands. Oh, boy, this sounds legalistic. This sounds like hard. Jesus is teaching salvation through obedience to the commands. Well, of course he's not. Jesus is the one who's taught him his whole ministry. The only way you're saved, the only way you get eternal life is believing in me plus nothing. Believing in me, period, is the way to eternal life, right? But, but apparently the commands are, you know, I think this is wonderful because Jesus taught his disciples tons of stuff, okay? He taught them parables about what the kingdom's like. That's probably one of the predominant things Jesus talked about, right? The kingdom of heaven is like this giant tree. The kingdom of heaven is like, um, you know, all these other images, a man who goes out and throws seed. You know, so he taught them about people. He taught anthropology. He taught eschatology. He taught about end time stuff, what it's going to be like when he comes back and sets up his kingdom, you know, and different parables about what that's going to be like. It's going to be like a shepherd that gets his sheep and his goats and he separate, you know, and this and that. He taught his disciples tons of stuff. And he gave them about maybe 5% of what he taught them was actually commands actually practical stuff you know like when you pray i don't want you to be like the pharisees i don't want you to make a big show of it you know when you get a chance to pray you make it discreet you know preferably go in your room close the door and actually make it secret so nobody else knows you're doing it practical stuff you know and then he'd go on and talk about you know the kingdom of heaven da 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 but the nice thing is the encouraging thing is when you're discipling somebody you don't have to teach them everything in the bible Okay, that's the job of those who are in the church appointed to be teachers. And James says not everybody should presume to be that kind of a teacher, a teacher of doctrine. You know, I, I as a pastor, I have to teach the whole counsel of God. I can't just teach the commands, the practical stuff. I have to teach the whole counsel of God. But everybody can disciple people because the teaching content for discipling someone is not all the stuff. It's just specifically the commands. So, okay, so yeah, um, you know, back to your squiggle. Three, the two components of discipling someone is just teaching them. And, and, and um, sharing life with them during that period of time that you're teaching them. And Jesus uh, adds those two, the two details that Jesus adds were, number one, I want you to, when you dis make disciples, I want you to baptize yours. So that's, that's the third thing that you can add into your, your squiggle there. That's the third one, baptizing them. Okay. It wasn't required by the verb disciple somebody. That wasn't required to disciple somebody in, in the ancient period. But he says, when you guys make disciples, you know, doing it the Christian way, I want you to disciple them. And he tells them, make sure they get discipled in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is why Christians have been doing that for, for 2,000 years. And then the second detail he added, which I already said, is, you know, he gave us specifically the specific thing he wants us to teach them. We don't have to teach them everything in the Bible, just the practical stuff. How do we live life the Jesus way? All right. So that's it. And so all in all, we end up with only three components 
of discipling somebody the way Jesus explicitly said he wants us to. Okay? Um, so I'm real open to, you know, reading books on discipleship. I'm working on a master's with an emphasis in discipleship. So I'm, I'm big on, like, learning from other people about discipleship. What I'm not open to is ignoring any of these three parts that he explicitly said he wants to be a part of discipling people. You know, because people are real creative, you know, and, and it's easy for us to get cluttered. And, you know, there's some good books on discipleship out there. One of them that I'll su- suggest is, is called... Um, Disciples are made, not born. I forget the name of the author. He came to Moody once and spoke, but a very good book. Um, but at any rate, um, the point is, you know, if this, this word, which perfect timing, if this word, mathe tevo, is the word Jesus used, and that's what it involved, teaching someone and sharing life with them, and then he said, and I also want you to baptize them, you know, call me crazy, but those are the things I definitely want to make sure is part of the way I disciple somebody. So, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide. Yes, these are like scrolls. This is like a scroll PowerPoint. The Hebrews would be proud of us this morning. Okay, um, okay yeah, why don't you just camp out right there? Um, I, th- I think I might have had Acts 14.21 on there, but um, I'm just going to read Acts 14.21 if, as much as I can by memory. If you have your Bible, you can turn to it, and then you'll really get the full thing. But basically, we had that slide, and we saw last week how you know, did they actually go out and do this after Jesus left? Did they actually go out and teach people and the commands and share life with them for a period of time? And we see that that's exactly what they did. Um, Acts 14.21, you know, Acts gives us the account of Paul. Um, and it says he went basically from city to city. First, he preached the gospel. And then when people got saved, sometimes they had questions. And so he'd come and talk to them later in a smaller group, you know. Um, but when they got saved, the next thing he did was he would stay there for a while and disciple him. Acts 14, 21. When Paul and, and Barnabas, when they had preached the gospel there, and they're in Derby for this verse, and discipled many people, they returned to the other cities, strengthening the disciples there. And after they had given them some encouragement, how they have to, you have to remain faithful to the Lord through many trials, it says then they appointed elders for each of them, for them in the various churches. So the three verbs in that verse are Paul preached that Paul and, and Barnabas, they preached the gospel, they discipled a whole lot of people, and then for these little pockets of disciples in each of these cities, they would appoint elders for them, and that was where the birth of the, 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 the churches, you know, the Gentile churches. So, and we're in that, we're in that tradition, we're a Gentile church, most of us, you know. Um, but that's how it worked, you know, they preached the gospel, they would disciple someone, sometimes they would stay there for six months, sometimes nine months discipling, and like I, I think I mentioned earlier, we have record of time Paul staying up to two years in a specific city just to disciple those believers, and then he'd move, he'd kind of go back and visit them again later and see, see how they were doing, but he would appoint elders for them. And yeah, that's what they did. And they were to keep doing that. You know, those new churches that were formed, it wasn't all supposed to be dependent on Paul and the apostles, right? Because how are they going to do all the people groups in just one lifetime? There's 6,000 people groups around the world. There's 800 people groups in Papua New Guinea alone. I'm pretty sure they didn't make it that far. You know what I mean? So the implication there is just like everything else that Jesus told the 12, like when you pray, do this, you know, it's for us. It's for subsequent followers of Jesus. You know, us sitting here today, we're to make disciples, to carry that mission on until it's done discipling people from all the people groups. So today, that's what we're going to look at. Um, discipleship through the centuries. Um, and this will be by far the, the shortest of the sermons. Because um, there's not a whole lot out there that where this word, discipling, this mate teva word, is explicitly used. I'm, I only like working with stuff that's certain if I'm going to say it from the pulpit. So... I'm only going to go with times where this word actually occurs and we, where some text says, okay, Paul discipled somebody, you know, so I'm only going to look at those samples and there's not a whole lot, but there is enough to get a picture that, that they did this. Okay. So we're going to start by the, there's been 80 generations of Christians from Jesus till today. So first we're going to look at the first 79 and then we're going to close by looking at the group that's in this room. All right. So what we know, and you can, you can scroll. Yep. Um, this is not Christian discipleship before Jesus. You know, Isocrates, disciple Ephorus. You can go on to the next one. Sophilus, good-looking guy, discipled Antiphon. And you can keep going. These weren't, this wasn't Christian discipleship. The Pharisees discipled people. And they keep going. 
Jesus disciple people. Okay, there. Now we're getting, we're getting into the Christian era. Jesus obviously discipled the 12. And then we're going to look at examples of Christians discipling others in the subsequent generations. So you can keep going there. Yep. Keep going. Here we go. Yep. That's what your squiggle should look like if it's done, all three of those. Keep, yep, you can keep going. Okay. That's the extra detail he adds, specifically the commands. So there it is. Okay, and there's my Acts 14.21. They preached the gospel and discipled people and then appointed elders so they could have little local churches. All right. Keep going. And you can stop right there. Okay. So generation number one, the first generation of disciples, we know their names, okay? They were the 12 disciples. There's no way you can see that, I understand. But that's Jesus at the top, and I've got the discipleship squiggle. So Jesus discipled Peter, Andrew, James, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, Bartholomew, James, and John. Okay, we all know that from Scripture, right? The words are used, he discipled them. All right. So their generation, they would be generation, um, I guess Jesus would be generation one if you want to like go by chains. They would be generation two. And then who did they disciple? Well, we know from history that uh, Paul joined their group. Okay, so Paul wasn't originally part of the 12. We know he actually was a first century kind of uh, terrorist in a way. He was like a Jewish terrorist who went around killing Christians. Okay, and then he became a Christian. So isn't that kind of how it happens? You know, uh, he started off persecuting us and they become one of us. Um, Paul, so Paul gets in the mix and you can go to the next slide and I throw Paul in there on the left side. All right, and Judas dropped it, dropped out. Um, we know from history that Paul discipled a group of people in the city of Derby. We just read it alongside with, of Barnabas, right? Acts 14, 21. Paul and Barnabas discipled many people in the city of Derby. And your NIV translation, which I, that's one of my favorites, um, butchered it. They have Paul and Barnabas won a large number of disciples. So when you read Acts 14, 21, if you use, like my wife and I, the new NIV, it's going to say they won a lot of disciples, which is making it sound like it was, they're mixing it with the evangelistic task that they did. Um, and in the Greek, it says none of that. There's no word win. Disciples is not a noun there. It's just simply Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel, evangelizo, and then they discipled many people. Mate tevo, I think it's ekastos, many. It discipled many people. That's all it says. So Paul discipled, and you can um, put that, there you go. Paul discipled a whole lot of people. I got Paul and then a little squiggle there for who he discipled. Don't write that in on your next one because we're starting with um, Jesus um, and John and that one. But, uh, but that was one discipleship chain that was started. And we don't have any records of who the people in Derby discipled after Paul left them. But hopefully they kept the discipling going in their area. Okay, you can go to the next side. Uh, we also know from history that John, okay, the youngest of the 12, he's way over there on the right side. Um, the, the apostle who wrote the book of John, you know, his time with Jesus, he discipled a guy named Polycarp. Okay, so you can go, yep, you can go to the next one. And uh, here's the writing that we have that from. Um, yep, just a little bit further down, right there. Um, it's, it's in one of the writings of Irenaeus, you know, which these are first and second century pieces of writing that are there so they're written in greek and i've got the greek text there and you can see the word mathe tevo if you know any any greek or you can kind of see the letters that in red there that's mathe that's the passive so that's mathe tev these but basically in english polycarp was discipled by the apostles and other writings that you read they specify that it was john in particular that took polycarp under his wing okay so you can go to that next slide so john now you can write this in on your thing because I've got the, that, that chain for you to complete. Jesus discipled John, right? We know that. John discipled who? Exactly. Yep. You guys are with me. Yep. Um, and then we know that Polycarp kept the discipleship chain going. And we're going to find out from history who he discipled. And this is from a book called The Martyrdom of Polycarp, a letter. Um, and it says, these things Caius transcribed from the copy of Irenaeus who was a disciple of Polycarp. And you can see the word mate tu in the second line in the Greek there. He was a mate tu to Polycarpu. He was a disciple of Polycarp. Okay, so the same words used. This mate tevo uh, verb and this, this noun mate tes are being used again. Same language is being used. 
John discipled Polycarp, and Polycarp discipled who? Yep, Irenaeus. So I, you can write Irenaeus. And now that, yeah, I leave it on that side just for a second, because now you can see this is, four, this is a four-generation discipleship chain that we've got so far, right? Jesus to John, John to Polycarp, and Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. I don't know how long he discipled them. It doesn't say. I don't know if it was six months, if it was two years, but for a while, that means he, he spent time with, with the guy and taught him the New Testament way to live life, the commands, assuming he did it the way Jesus said to do it, which he probably did because, you know, he, you know, he was a leader in the church and he probably knew the words of Jesus. So, um, okay, so that's a four generation chain. Unfortunately, I, we don't have the, any, I don't have any more writings from history that I found of the chain of continuing um, past Irenaeus. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see, what's, who do we have next? Okay, now we kind of have to skip ahead. See, what happens is this. History does not care about the average Joe. Okay? They care about the, the leaders. Okay? Histories are, are written about the leaders, the important people. So, you know, if I disciple one of the young adults at Fuel over the next six months, you know what I mean? Here in Rockford, Illinois, what are the odds that's going to make the history books and people 2,000 years ago are going to be able to read about it? Oh, Solomon, he discipled, you know, Jacob. Oh, wow, that's great. You know, History doesn't follow the little guys. History follows the church leaders. All these guys are kind of leaders. You know, Polycarp ended up being a pastor, a leader of a church, actually a bishop of a church in Smyrna. And Irenaeus was a leader. So we have the accounts of the leaders discipling other people individually. Um, but there's a lot of gaps in history. So we don't, you know, to find the next example of a discipleship chain where these actual words are used, you've got to skip all the way from generation four to generation 14. What happened in between, I don't know, but I sure hope they discipled people. But yeah, in Generation 14 in the literature, you find that there's a, another leader, because that's, that's why he, it's in history, he, we know his story a little bit, um, named Basil. He discipled a guy named uh, Helon. Okay? And you can go to the next one. That's Generation 14. He discipled Helon in a Generation 15. All right. So... Um, Suffice to say, through the centuries, discipleship chains were formed. People discipled other people. And again, it's hard to follow all the chains. There's another chain that I didn't put on there, a guy named Arius, about the same time as, as Basil, generation 14, generation 15, somewhere in there, discipled a guy named Eustatius. Um, but I'm sure that there were way more chains than that through history, and I'm sure that a lot of the chains got broken. Okay? You know, because that's how it goes. Um, certain disciples, I'm sure, were discipled by somebody, and then for whatever reason, they didn't pass that on to somebody else younger than them. And so that their discipleship chain got broken. Okay. All right. Now, that brings us to the present right now here in this room. So, yeah. Now, this, this yeah, you, you can go back up just a little bit. I'll zoom in on the, the next one, but... I want you to see, because I'm going to go to the present, and I just want you to see how far, just the, kind of spatially, that we're, you know, we're a long ways away from Jesus in these, these first few generations that we've been looking at. But yeah, that's Jesus way at the top, that little dot, generation 1, 2, 3, 14, 15, and then you can scroll down a little, and you'll see, that's us way down here, okay? In, in this room, 2017, in, in this room, we probably have members of five generations, okay? We've got some guys in the builder's generation. If you were born before World War II, you're in the builder's generation, okay? So I know we've got a bunch in this room. Um, anyone from 1925 to 1945, that's the builder's generation. And if you use math using 25 years for a generation, you builders, you'd be generation 77, okay? Just to help you feel out your place in, in Christian history, okay? Generation 78 is the boomers. There's a lot of those in America, right? Um, 1946 to 1964, you're a boomer, generation 78. Uh, the Busters, generation 79, I'm sure we got some of you here. You're from 1965 to 1979. If you were born in those years, that 15 year period, you're a, you're a, um, a Buster, also known as generation X. Uh, my generation, generation 79.5, we don't even get counted as our own unique generation. We're like somewhere between the, the Busters and, and these kids, but uh, that's all right. I'm not bitter much. 1980 to 1995 millennials, all right? That's us. 
And then if you were born between 1995 and 2010, so if you're between the ages of 7 and 22, you're in generation number 80. Kind of cool. I wish I was generation 80. And you're generation Z. All right, but the point is, we are here. You know, you have those maps that you go to a zoo, and it says you're here, and it's got the little arrow. Well, in history, this is where we're at, okay? Um, discipleship chains through the centuries get broken, you know? Things get messy. Um, some churches, you know, um, maybe they carry out discipleship in their church, and maybe it goes on for three, four generations, and, you know, new, new faces come in, younger people um, come, they disciple them, and maybe they disciple them. Maybe it goes on for three or four generations, and then it gets broken, and that church gets maybe sidetracked by some other really good thing, um, and it just kind of falls off in terms of discipling people. Um, that's how it happens. You know, the mission gets messy and chains get broken. Um, me personally, I know, I'm the, I, I grew up in one church family um, in Racine, you know, for 30 years. And I never had anybody disciple me, you know. And we were a good, strong, evangelical church, you know. Um, I had plenty of Bible studies. Our church was really good on, on studying the Bible, you know. Um, so, and, you know, we were pretty decent at evangelism, studying the Bible. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we didn't... We didn't, nobody discipled me. Nobody took me under their wing and said, hey, let me show you how to obey how, what the Jesus commands are for living life. And let me share my life with you for a little while. And, and this is discipling you. And then, you know, eventually you can do this for somebody else. You know, we didn't use those words. We didn't have any kind of discipleship literacy. So we just didn't talk like that. You know, we had Bible studies, prayer time, um, evangelism. But you know, we knew we knew the word discipleship, and it was like kind of becoming more like Jesus. So we knew it was like it was good, and it was kind of somehow a part of like this Christian thing. But we didn't know actually what it was, how to do it. You know, um, um, so yeah. And so my generation, my whole generation from my home church, there was a big group of us. None of us caught a vision for for discipling people. You know, um, but you know that's what happens. The mission gets messy, and stuff happens along on the way. Chains get broken. Uh, but my encouragement to us is let's start fresh. You know. Here in this church family, in this season of our church family, let's start again. Let's start fresh here. Um, so uh, just cl- um, working towards the conclusion here. This church the, here in this room, we probably have five generations represented. Um, five and a half if you count the millennials. You know. um, and just think about what an amazing opportunity that is. You know, This is our turn. This is our chance. And then we're gone. We're like basil, you know, we're like, they'll be in generation 90 pretty soon, you know, and it'll probably come faster than you know it, because that's how time go, goes faster the, the further along it goes, doesn't it? You know, this is our chance. You know, everybody just gets one chance to figure out about Jesus, who he was, what it means, you know, to hear the gospel, to get saved, hopefully, and then to figure out his final words and this mission that he gave his regular non-clergy followers. Go and disciple other people. We just get one chance. And I'm just going to um, re-ask the question that I asked last week. Why should God put people in our lives for us to share the gospel with and open up doors for us to share or bring them to our church family to hear the gospel if we're not ready to disciple them once they get saved? So my encouragement to us is let's get clear now and stay clear from 2017 onward. Let's recatch the clear simplicity of what it means to disciple somebody. It's simple. You know, last week, so simple, even a caveman could do it. Anybody can do this. No degree required. And then my encouragement to you guys is I would like to see everybody in this room that's all in with Jesus. We saw already, if you're, not, if you're still investigating Jesus, still getting to know him, you're not ready to be completely committed to him, wait on that. Keep getting to know him. But if you're at that point, and I'm sure there's a bunch in this room that, that you passed that point a long time ago, you want your whole life to be lived the Jesus way, then my encouragement to you is in 2018, I would like to see you either being discipled by somebody, or if you're ready to disciple somebody else, discipling somebody else every single person in this room i would like to see involved so next week i'm going to issue a challenge to you and kind of give some some structure to that and a plan for for this upcoming year um, for a six month period of the year everybody in this room will have a chance to to disciple one other person or be discipled so all right 
uh, last week we saw how there's only three components of discipling someone. Teaching them, sharing life with them for, for a season, and then Jesus says make sure they get baptized too. Um, this week that we've seen how through the, the centuries, disciples did it. They passed on the baton. Discipleship chains were formed, and we've seen how sometimes those chains have gotten broken. Um, but by God's grace, here in this church, you know, and if you guys are humble enough to follow my lead on it, we're going we're gonna to start fresh, and we're going to see a discipleship revival start here in this church, hopefully spread to the rest of Rockford. I'm writing to some area pastors, and there's already hunger for discipleship, and it's starting. You see Francis Chan, I see little churches, pockets starting of, of people re-catching how simple it is to disciple other people, and hey, that this should be a part of what we're doing. Um, so, so I encourage you to all be here for, um, for next week uh, for the 2018 TBC MCF Discipleship Challenge. So that's, that's all I've got.